Yes, it was wonderful. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, very cool. Kind of, kind of wild to get into the, to the head of some of these pilots and what they've gone through, what they've seen, and what they have to to train for to be here. And you know, the the precision and 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 all the the work that goes into just a little 15 to 18 minute show. You know, so it's a, it's it's pretty amazing uh, uh, to see Dan. Yeah. So. Uh, Glad you could be here. Warriors over the Wasatch Air and Space Show live from Hill Air Force Base. Dan Hawkins from the AETC Public Affairs team alongside Matt from KSL yep. 5, the, the morning weather guy. Yeah, I am. <laughs> How's the weather progressing? Oh, uh, very nice. Right on right on par with what we were expecting for this hour. You know, uh, very smooth air for these guys to be flying in. You know, you think about it, you experience turbulence in just a, a commercial airline. Uh, you're not doing any tricks. You out here, you, you see turbulence. That could throw off your move. You're flying 300 feet above the ground. So it's nice to have the smooth air out here and not to mention great weather for all the spectators uh, that have come out to Hill Air Force Base. Um, so it's uh, really, really cool. And we'd be remiss if we didn't thank the second audiovisual squadron. All these fantastic pictures brought to you by this squadron based out of Hill Air Force Base. So big thanks to our entire crew out there uh, making it happen. And uh, uh, Matt, honestly, are, are these not incredible shots? Oh, just it's it's a. I mean, look how low he is to the ground. Uh, and, and uh, later on in the show, you'll probably see more jets. And, and we were just talking to uh, Kristen Bayo Wolf. Uh, 300 feet above the ground going 100, who knows how many hundreds of miles an hour, upside down, cockpit uh, facing the ground there. And um, it's just amazing to see these guys do these maneuvers. And like she was saying, some of these aircraft are actually, um, they actually go to war. It's not just for show. Some of these will be going out to, to the field to work. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to go straight to war, but they're actually used in real-time situations. Uh, you know, I don't know the exact name of the uh, the aircraft we're watching right now, but you know, these guys uh, put a lot of time uh, into making this show happen. A lot of years of, of experience and expertise, and really just honing in uh, on, on 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 these crazy moves uh, that, that they're doing. All right, Matt, we're going to go ahead and send it out to the air boss for a little bit and catch some of the air show narration. Take a listen. Record. They got there first. When they got into Canada, they were based at CFB Trenton. Canadian Forces Base Trenton. So low to your right, the legendary aircraft of reconnaissance and training and fighter and racing and record-keeping and record-breaking is the De Havilland Vampire. Jets after the World War II, well, it would go into a jet dogfight arena in the Korean War. It would be mostly our F-86 Sabre swept wing aircraft against the MiG aircraft, another swept wing aircraft with captured German aeronautical data that showed us that a swept wing aircraft was superior to offset Buffett boundary. Lockheed did not have an entry that was a swept wing aircraft. North America did because of the information gleaned from the Germans after the war. So did the Russians with the MiG-15 swept wing aircraft. And it was to be a swept wing dogfight pure jet with the exception of one Navy pilot in a piston powered airplane that gained ace status in the Korean War. Great profile, Jerry Jet Connolly and the legendary de Havilland Vampire. Maximum speed on the aircraft, 548 miles an hour. That's the red line. You saw the Jerry's got a couple of tanks on the aircraft. Range of over 1,000 miles with aux tanks and with proper oxygen. Able to cruise up in the 40,000 foot range. By the way, it had day and night capability as well. Another 
Another tip of the hat to the British in their design. Making it versatile in many different regimes and then adding day and night capability. For the perfect sky for air show smoke. Twin boom, De Havilland Vampire. Get ready with your cameras and your phone cameras because coming in over our right shoulder in an arcing pass, you'll be able to clip shots with a plan view. Coming in from your right, putting it up on the left wing. There is a photo opportunity against the mountains. We're going to land Jerry Connolly. There'll be a few minutes if you have to go. And you know what I mean, if you have to go visit the facilities while we recover Jerry Connolly, there'll be a little bit of time before our next routine. So if you've been waiting to go because you didn't want to miss any of the flying action, you can head off now, do that, or enjoy a drink or a food item or more activity with suntan lotion sun blocker, lip protection, and hydrated. Stay hydrated. So as Jerry Connolly gets ready to land with the va vampire, we'll get ready for our next act. I want to remind you, too, that uh, you can dream big. Stop by Dream Big Entertainment out there and jump in the cockpit of the F-18. Uh, make sure you tell Jake happy birthday and uh, get your picture taken for those Christmas cards and all those other great moments. Remember your day here at Warriors over the Wasatch. All right, now shortly we're going to change the pace again to the world of unlimited monoplanes and our most dynamic guy. His name is Bob Freeman. We call him uh, Buzzkill Bob is his new name, and I'll tell you why it, uh, it deals with a turkey vulture in air-to-air -air combat, and I'll tell you the result. Bob started flying back in 1972 in junior high school. Had a, a very uh, high passion for competition aerobatics. And over the years, over four decades, he has brought home the gold in both national and international competition representing the United States of America. A degree in mechanical engineering with honors. Retired position as a chief technologist of Seagate Corporation. An inventor with 14 patents. And life goes good for a while, then life gets a little a little turn. Bob had a, a bout with leukemia some years ago. And he would like to thank the scientists, the researchers, the doctors, the nurses, and the caregivers, and his family for providing his survival to get back in the cockpit. Now having, after four decades, retired from competition, he is now 
devoted to air show flying. I gotta tell you about Buzzkill Bob, that's a relatively new name. He was out flying a turkey vulture that weighed five pounds and Bob got into a dogfight at 145 miles per hour. The turkey vulture took a big chunk out of Bob's vertical stabilizer. Bob got the airplane safely on the ground and was okay. Not so for the turkey vulture. Don't mess with Bob. They repaired the aircraft. It's back in use again. And uh, four more turkey vultures and he can, Bob Freeman can go to ace status. All right, Bob Freeman, now turn around and look up. Start the music again, we get ready for a sky dance. Bob has a wild entry, it's a series of snap rolls. Okay, there's Bob over the tower. You see he's got the altitude he wants. Now you're not gonna believe this neck snapping, disorientation, as he does the curly cues on the descending line at a blistering pace. This partly comes from his world of competition. This partly comes from his showmanship. Imagine yourself twisting and turning in this airplane. Blue green, blue green, blue green, ground sky, ground sky, ground sky. Now a hammerhead turnaround. As he pulls to the right, a grueling amount of gravity forces him into his seat, pulling to the vertical, rolling the aircraft. He'll do what we call a vertical reverse. Out of that, he'll do a knife edge spin. Knife edge is when you fly on the fuselage. Spinning is when you're spinning around on the descent. And both are a combination of the same thing. Knife edge spin, he'll stop it right about there. Then we'll look for that maneuver we explained to the early. Known as the Lumsabak, the equivalent of drinking too much plum brandy. You get tipsy and out of control, and this is what happens if you try to walk or fly. Now, off on your right, the sky dance will include, again, the vertical reverse, known as the hammerhead, with a little rudder dance on the way up. Little rudder left, little rudder right, little rudder left, little rudder right. Let's dance it on up. Lead off all the speed, full left rudder, a little right aileron. Now, coming back in, Bob Freeman. Many years of competition and the medals to prove it. We'll head at Airshow Center for the torque roll. Pull to the vertical, slice the horizon, 90 degrees, start to roll the airplane. The speed will start to dissipate. Gravity will start to take over. With the power from the engine, and the propeller spinning backwards with the torque of the engine. Now the sky dance, maneuver one after the other, staying in front of the audience at all times. Pulling to the vertical, rolling the aircraft on the way up, stopping it. Stick gently back into his lap. Down on the 45 degree line, that's what we call the shark's tooth with a series of rolls. Now another variation of the vertical reverse of the hammerhead turn is the pinwheel shoulder roll. Up he goes once again, forced down into his seat. Into the shoulder roll, gyroscopic maneuvers, recovering right side up. And a small hairpin turnaround. Straight up, hairpin turnaround. And we'll watch for the spin maneuver on the descent. There's the spin as promised. Now rolling the aircraft in the knife edge flight. Gaining altitude.
down line roll. This now we'd like to talk to you about Bob's sponsor. We'd like to thank our friends at N. Kenley Ford. We'd like to recognize that Kenley Ford and specifically Julie Kenley for her continued support of the Warriors over the Wasatch Air Show. As a patron sponsor of the Top of Utah Military Affairs Committee, Ed Kenley Ford has been serving military families since 1981. The values of service, courage, discipline, and integrity, the same ones that inspire our team to treat each customer that visits our dealership in Layton just like family. And Ed Kenley Ford, we speak only one language, cars. Of course, we're fluent in many dialects, including parts, service, and finance. If you're interested in learning the lingo yourself, stop by and see us at, at our Layton, Utah showroom today. Whether you hail from Layton, Clearfield, Clinton, Syracuse, or Kaysville, we'll be happy to bring you up to speed. If you feel like speed, come in and drive the all-electric Mustang Mach-E. Feels like you're serious, seriously pulling some Gs. Let's not forget the new tough Bronco. Bronco Sport Maverick and Lightning models. Add to that our lifetime warranty on all vehicles. The fact that we never charge over MSRP. And you've got a Top Gun solution. All right, now we'll watch for Bob once again to come from off of his perch. He gained a little bit of altitude on that brake to cool down his engine instruments and oil. Rolling the aircraft and again a blistering rate of roll. Now watch for him to do a spin the hard way, spinning the aircraft on the way up. Power to weight ratio of the engine the construction of the airplane, but the talent of Bob Freeman is what allows you to do this. An upward spin. Now, combining several maneuvers into one, Bob Freeman will be coming back in, setting up two maneuvers into one. It will be a loop. On the top of the loop, upside down, he will snap roll the aircraft. We call this the avalanche. Around once, around twice, around three times, recovering inverted. Now, Bob's going to do half of a loop. He'll get it with some altitude. Now, watch, he'll kick the rudder left, rudder right and flip the airplane end over end. He'll have room to do it again. Watch the rudder left, right, and then a flip end over end. They call that the Dinks Maneuver. Now to stay on stage, off on your right, it is the hairpin turnaround, bringing him from right to left. Now as he comes back in, he's going to do what he calls the right foot slide with a negative G or outside snap roll. Positive G's force you down into your seat. Negative G's try to force you out of your seat, held in only by a double set of safety straps. Into the maneuver. The slide, then the outside snap, still gaining altitude. Floating across the top. All right, Bob Freeman coming back in from your left. We'll execute the eight-point hesitation roll. In level flight, stopping the airplane every 45 degrees of rotation, starting with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Spiraling tower off on your right. Folks, this is grueling work. This is punishment. There's pain in this flight. Oh, that pilot's sitting down. Oh, that pilot's got no worry. No, sir. Not, not true at all. It hurts. It takes conditioning, both physically and mentally. Now, using the left rudder, a little bit of slide maneuver. And from there, a very scientific maneuver known as the flop.
Recovering and flying inverted. Now rolling to the right side up position. A quick turnaround will bring Bob Freeman back in for the centrifuge. Stay on stage. Half Cuban eight maneuver. That's five eights of a loop. You know that by now. All right, this is a tribute to his good buddy Bill Stein. We'll be flying later on today. <laughs> This is called the Steinway, a maneuver invented by Bill Stein and copied with great admiration by Bob Freeman. And by the way, what's the Steinway? Oh, about uh, 625 pounds. Okay, yeah, that goes back to the 1960s, George. Okay. <laughs> All right, eyes and cameras out on the center stage. Remember those farmers who were out planting their crop even in the darkness this morning. They're ready to harvest that crop. They're going to do it with a signal from Bob Freeman. Bob Freeman, high and to the right. The pyro will come at ground level. If you want to get them both in the shot, in your cameras, get a little bit of the earth. Get a little bit of the earth. This is a there you see inside the office. So again, that shot with uh, the pyro and Bob, get a little bit of the ground in the bottom of whatever device you're using to take the picture and have it mostly sky. <laughs> then you will get the pyro from the ground up, you'll get the airplane, you'll get the mountains, you'll get all the color, you'll get the action. So we're going to pyro, Firewalkers, Pyro International, Sarge Myers and his group of veterans, 150 years of professional pyro experience. They already started out the show once, augmenting the U.S. Army Golden Knights. He's sent into the ground. Okay, from your right, eyes and cameras. Let's have some fun. Let's, somebody give me a lighter. Got a lighter? Fun with pyrotechnics. Okay, that part of the... <laughs> that uh, pyro has been harvested. That was a successful crop, but there's other crops that are growing out there. We're going to be using them throughout the course of the day as well. All right, getting aircraft on the ground. Now we're going to go into some movie action, some Top Gun action. As we get ready to land Bob, remind, reminding you that uh, this is the fourth weekend of the Tom Cruise, David Ellison movie known as Top Gun Maverick, breaking all box office, office records and uh, featuring the FAA team. <laughs> in uh, American film. It's a film about American values. That's why it's been doing so well. That's why it's going to exceed a mil billion dollars in box office receipts worldwide. 410, 412 million dollars after last weekend. This weekend will be another big motion picture uh, watching show as word gets around that this is the picture to watch featuring an FA-18. We have one here. We have a cockpit. Dewey Larson got his FA-18 cockpit on a trailer. It's a movie plane. It's a Blue Angels airplane. You could be in the cockpit having your picture taken. Take it home. It's a memento. You'll get it right there. It is absolutely great. We are ready for FA-18 Top Gun action as the Super Hornet gets ready to fly. 
All right, folks, fasten your safety belts on behalf of the United States Navy, Naval Air Station of Moor, Commander Strike Fighter Wing Pacific, and the Commanding Officer of Strike Fighter Squadron 122. We are proud to present the West Coast FA-18 Super Hornet Flight Demonstration. The aircraft performing for you today is the F model, which incorporates a two-place cockpit to accomplish the assigned mission. In today's demonstration, Pilots Lieutenant Thomas Shirley Callison, call, call sign Moners from Austin, Texas. The Weapon Systems Officer Lieutenant Jordan Swazo, call sign Peach from Ocean City, California. They'll demonstrate the incredible flight characteristics of the Super Hornet. All right, Lieutenant Shirley has extensive combat experience in the F-A-18, has flown numerous sorties in support of Operation Inherit Resolve and Western Stability and other operations around the globe. During this flight, they will experience G-force extremes from negative 3 Gs up to eight times the normal force of gravity as they maneuver the aircraft to the edge of its operating envelope. Today's show will be performed at speeds as fast as 700 miles per hour and slow as 100 miles per hour. Many of the maneuvers you will see here today demonstrate the aircraft's capabilities in the tactical arena and are employed during combat and training. Hey, flight. welcome back into the Warriors over the Wasatch Air and Space Show here at Hill Air Force Base. Dan Hawkins, Matt Johnson. Hey, it has been a lot of fun today. We've had a lot of airplanes the F-22 Raptor. I think that's oh. your personal favorite. Just, <laughs> no, I, just admit it. Well, I have a couple friends that are training to be pilots, and they keep saying, you know, it's rare to see an F-22. And I was like, well, it's in the script. Like, it's going to be here. And sure enough, there they were. So uh, uh, allegedly, it's, uh, it's exclusive to have the F-22s because there's so few uh, is what I'm hearing. So kind of, kind of exciting stuff uh, as we head throughout the day. All right. So we're going to actually switch gears a little bit. I, actually, I would probably say a lot, but uh, Colonel Jason Bartolome, he's the director of the ground-based strategic deterrent systems directorate here at Hill Air Force Base. Uh, the Air Force is replacing the Minuteman uh, 3 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM, with the GBSD, which is now going to be called the Sentinel. But, uh, sir, how are you? We'll fix that. Sound of freedom. The sound of freedom. <laughs> How are you? Great, thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, I got I got so rocked by the big jet coming by. Uh, and just real quick, do we know what kind of jet that was? was that that, that F was an F-18. Yep. So okay. if you saw the recent uh, Top Gun Maverick, uh, that's the exact same aircraft that uh, is flying in that movie. So but it's it is pretty not exciting. Tom Cruise, mind you. It is not Tom <laughs> it's a real Cruise. Time, real-time um, officer in there. So. And they did not hijack that plane from an enemy airfield <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> right, right. Okay, no right. foreign okay. no foreign aircraft from Russia or anything like that. <laughs> uh, now, now uh, can you tell can you tell us a little bit uh, about the 419th fighter wing uh, what what does it do in the big picture uh, of the air force well, and, and what is a wing oh well an aircraft wing is really uh, the aggregation of our, our fighting force and so uh, we have uh, two fighter wings here at hill air force base uh, but but people most people don't realize that there's a lot of other activities going on here at Hill Air Force Base. In fact, uh, Hill Air Force Base is the the nucleus of our our nation's uh, development of the replacement of the Minuteman III. Uh, so the Sentinel weapon system uh, that we just described is uh, what I'm responsible for. And my organization is essentially a wing that's devoted to replacing uh, our land-based leg of the Triad. Yeah. Wow. So that that's that's really interesting, right? So like ties to U.S. Strategic Command. But can you maybe explain like the triad for those who may not understand yeah. uh, national defense? I mean, sure. this isn't an airplane, but it, it you obviously is just as important. Well, so uh, you know, experts describe you know the back the backdrop of our nation's uh, security. Uh, and our plans is our, our nation's nuclear deterrent, and our nuclear deterrent has three legs, and it's uh, commonly referred to as the nuclear triad. And so we have uh, submarines that uh, run by the Navy, 
We have uh, uh, aircraft uh, that uh, uh, fly and ha are nuclear capable. And then we have intercontinental ballistic missiles. And each one of those uh, uh, represent the triad. And so the submarines we describe as the survivable leg of the triad. The aircraft we described as the flexible leg of the triad. And the ICBMs uh, are the responsive leg of the triad. So uh, we have three legs. I mean, you just... You just got to take a minute and soak in the F-18. Oh, man. It's... Uh... You can feel it as much as you can hear it. It's pretty amazing stuff. Yes. I, uh, yeah. So I was. Uh, I think uh, the whole the whole crowd is looking forward to a few of the demos today. Uh, we have the F-18 demo flight, which is happening right now, and so it's going to be uh, thunderous. Uh, but later today, we'll have the F-35 demo. Uh, so it could not be more exciting uh, here at the air show. Yeah. Uh, and so the 419th uh, the 419th is part of the total force concept. What exactly does that mean? Oh, well, so, so, so I think the 419th commander uh, it would answer that probably better than me. Ah. So, uh, so I, I, uh, uh, <laughs> he was my next door neighbor for a couple of years. <laughs> um, uh, he, 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 he knows about uh, as much about nuclear missiles as I know about uh, the 419th. So uh, what we'll do is uh, uh, let him answer that here in a couple of minutes when he's on. <laughs> I think in air show parlance, what we got there was just a high speed pass right there. Yeah. So, so what is it that your unit does um, uh, on a daily basis when it comes to the transition of, you know, uh, from the Minuteman to the Sentinel? Why is it so important? Well, yeah. So it's it's really important. Um, you know, some experts call the land based leg of the triad the backbone of the triad. And what we have are three missile wings um, that uh, live in the upper uh, mountain west. And each one of those missile wings have 400 intercontinental ballistic missiles on alert. And these missiles are on alert 24, day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I think what most people don't realize is that these missile wings are the size of, mi of mid-Atlantic states. So if you think about Connecticut, if you think about uh, Massachusetts, if you think about Maryland, each one of those states is about the same size of one of our missile wings. And so these missile wings are really important because the size and the scale of those missile wings with our ICBMs makes threatening our nuclear deterrent very challenging for the adversary. And it, it makes the land-based leg of the of the deterrent just so important, and that's why what we're doing here at Hill Air Force Base is, is so important. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at Hill yeah. and uh, you know, why it's so important. So, as I mentioned, Hill is is the is the nucleus um, of the development of the land-based leg of the triad. So for the last oh almost 45 years the men and women of hill air force base have been sustaining those missiles up in those missile wings and so you know if you have ever been at hill air force base you see what a large base it is it's the largest employer in the state and many of the men and women that work out at hill not only work on the planes but they're also working on taking care of the systems that are out in the field the minuteman three the Minuteman III was only designed to last for 10 years. And we have been flying the system for 50 years. And so we describe the Sentinel system as a once in every other generation uh, development program. So it happens not once in a generation, but once in every other generation. And we take great pride in that here at Hill Air Force Base. So we lead... Uh, organization of 1,200 people. Most of them are here at Hill, but we have uh, colleagues that live in different parts of the nation. So it's a nationwide effort, and the and the nucleus of it is here at, at Hill Air Force Base. Wow, that that's really impressive. And so, so as we look at the the Sentinel that's coming online, like yeah. what does that timeline look like? Obviously, yeah. uh, a major part of your mission right now. But I mean, yeah. that's. That's a huge project. Well, so um, I'm really proud to say that 
um, for the folks here in Utah and, and, and those listening online, maybe not in Utah, the Sentinel Project has been already going on for eight years. And um, we have actually, uh, you know, with great pride, we've, we've hit all of our major milestones uh, for eight years. Um, and, and it's such a high priority from, from leadership in Washington, from people in the Pentagon. And so we've got great support uh, in Congress and great support in the Pentagon. And right now we're in the most uh, interesting and challenging phase of the project. So we're two years into what we call the engineering, manufacturing, and development phase, which is essentially we're now designing and building the system. And um, we're uh, only about two years away from flying the first new Sentinel missile from Vandenberg in California. And once that happens, uh, we will produce the, the system at scale, and we will start deploying it. And I'll give you a staggering statistic. We're going to replace uh, one Minuteman three missile a week for nine years. Uh, starting at the end of the decade. And so this is a massive mega project. It couldn't be more exciting. And I think it really captures uh, what we as Americans can do when we put our mind to something. It's a, it's a quite an amazing effort. And, and I think this is a kind of a good segue to, you know, uh, defense of this great nation takes many forms. I mean, at, yes. at Hill, obviously, the local community sees the F-35 flying through the air, and, and they think Air Force. But, uh, you know, obviously, nuclear deterrence is, yep. a, is a huge part, uh, as you talked about that triad. Um, but you work at, here at Hill directly with uh, some major elements of the Air Force uh, and the Joint Force uh, across the DOD with Air Force Global Strike Command. That's correct. Um, yep. as, as well as U.S. Strategic Command. Can you kind of talk about some of those synergistic relationships Absolutely. and how important, uh, you know, how you're kind of, a, honestly, it seems like a linchpin uh, to all, a lot of things. Well, so I think it, you know, it really starts at the top. I think that, uh, you know, it's been several years since the end of the Cold War, but I think that world events that we're seeing happening even today uh, really, you know, remind us how important the defense of our nation is and really how important the nuclear uh, triad is. I think that for the people of Utah, you know, in the last uh, three years alone, we've seen several thousand people move from all over the country uh, to, 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 to northern Utah to actually support this project. Um, the Northrop Grumman Corporation um, has built a campus not too far from the museum, just a little bit north of here. And that campus alone has 5,000 uh, engineers, program managers, finance uh, individuals, and some exciting opportunities. And so one of the things I would say is, one, is that for the people of Utah, you know, some of your new neighbors might be working on this uh, great project that truly is historic. I would also say that for those that are interested in, in adventure, you know, uh, by all means, look at the opportunities in the Air Force and at Northrop Grumman to be a part of something really special because we really need uh, just the smartest and the hardest working people uh, to help uh, bring this incredible project across the finish line because it, it will last for the next uh, 50 plus years. And uh, and it's really something special that we have here in Utah. The theme of this air show, innovate, accelerate, thrive. Of course, yes. the Air Force at 75. But can you maybe talk a, a little bit about how you guys are innovating and accelerating change that General Brown talks about? Absolutely. In fact, um, we've been really fortunate to have senior leaders visit uh, from the top of, of both Congress and the Pentagon. We were really grateful to have uh, the chief come and visit. So Chief Brown was here just a little over a year ago, and the secretary and the vice chief came about a couple weeks later. And one of the things that's really a, a little-known fact about the ICBM is that the, the whole discipline of systems engineering was born in the development of the ICBM the first time we built the system. And what you're seeing here inside of Sentinel is that uh, we're rebirthing digital engineering inside of the system. And so if you take a, a position or come and work with us, you're on the cutting edge of digital engineering, cybersecurity, software development, uh, modular uh, system design, um, and it's just super thrilling. So, you know, not only are we uh, in charge of a mega project, uh, 
but senior leaders in the Air Force, I think, have recognized that what's happening inside of the Sentinel program is is birthing the innovations that will really take us through the next several decades uh, to defend our country. So very exciting. Well, certainly exciting times for the Sentinel program. And thank you to thank the you. men and women of your organization who who uh, uh, taken us to the next level uh, for defense. So thank you for stopping yes. by. I hope you enjoy the rest I, of this air I show. Will. Thank you. Hey, you can't get tired of views like that. No, you can't. Colonel Jason Bartolome from the Sentinel program. So glad that he could join us. And Matt, another great picture of that F-18. Uh, just a beautiful sky, and we still have a lot more to come here this afternoon. Yeah, it's uh, and it's nice to have the uh, the blue skies out there so that when there are, is it called a streamer or a smoke trail? Is it a smoke trail? A vapor trail? A vapor trail. There you go. Um Nice to have that backdrop with the blue skies because if it was cloudy, as we mentioned before, you might not be able to see that. So it kind of adds to the show. Um, and, and, and now it sounds like we're going to get into talking to Staff Sergeant uh, Alex Zuniga. I don't think he's here he's yet. He's not here. He's okay. not here yet. But I thought this would maybe be a good time to show the crowd there's still room for you despite what you might wow. think. Look at that crowd here today uh, at Hill Air Force Base. And there are some things, Matt, that, that uh, they do recommend that maybe you should or should not uh, bring to the air show. Uh, you obviously don't want to bring things like, uh, you know, weapons, oh, you know, yeah, stuff yeah, like no, that. Nothing sharp. And, and you also want to be mindful that I was telling this to some of my friends that came is that you've got to have a sealed bottle. You can't bring your own little water bottle, but it's got to be sealed. Um, as you come in, we've got bathrooms here. We've got trash cans here. There's tons of vendors. So if you come out, uh, you can, um, Gosh, there's plenty of food. And, and honestly, it's so fun to rub shoulders with people that are so passionate about the Air Force, about the Army, about our country. You know, I think this is a – it's almost like a second Fourth of July, I'm almost feeling like. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a very – like you keep saying, when we hear those loud uh, jets come by, it's the sound of freedom. And, and it really is. You know, we've got – we are rubbing shoulders with people who – there's a lot of veterans in the crowd. Yes. It's not just, you know, we're all – public civilians but i mean there are people who have served this country uh some of my friends that came already said that they've spoken with a couple and, and some of the cool stories that they have and nice. it's really inspiring yeah you know these people that put their lives on the line that that spin you spent 20 years yeah you know and, and it's um it's it's something to behold it's something to it's really cool to to be next to and to converse with these people so yeah it's, you get uh, some shots of some more performers going up. You saw an earlier shot of Brad Worston in the extra 330LX high performance stunt plane. It's a two seat tandem monoplane. Um, it's going to be pretty impressive stuff uh, when he goes up there as you see uh, just the crowd, the expansive crowd that's coming up. Uh, there's still so much more on the schedule. And we are going to take it out now to the Air Boss to set up time for the P-51 and the A-10. Let's take it out there right now. Showcases the size and structural differences between the legacy and current platform used in naval aviation. Observe how the shape of the, and the general composition of the aircraft has been tra transformed to adapt to the evolving nature of warfare. will now be repositioning for the head-on pass. That will give you an outstanding view of the business end of the preeminent fighters of their respective generations. Get ready with your eyes and cameras, ladies and gentlemen, the head-on pass. from Logan.
Hey, back. Uh, the Air Boss taking us through some of the great acts here, and we've got a really cool act coming up here. Uh, the Extra 330LX. It's a high-performance stunt plane and, and flown by uh, a Logan native, Brad Worston. Yeah, he comes out of Cache Valley, and uh, it's it's fun to come to this. And, and sometimes you feel, um, you know, you see these guys up in the air, but it's just different to know that you and there's people watching from out of state you know but it's cool for the locals if you're watching on the ksl app or if you're here uh, listening to us in the stands it's, it's really cool to have a local guy i mean just anywhere you're at any state you have a a local come out and do these tricks you feel connected uh, you know you feel that pride that local pride and not to mention you know uh, our, our our air force and u.s army that are that are out here from all over the country we welcome them as well it's 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 really uh fun to have a local guy go up in the air all right, let's learn a little bit more about Brad Worston. I love speed. On ground, you're limited to dirt and water. The sky is it's endless. I just love the feeling of being free, doing aerobatic displays. I mean, it's just it's awesome. It's a great feeling. So tell me about the plane we're about ready to go up in. They call it an unlimited aerobatic airplane. It weighs 1,340 pounds, got 365 horsepower, got a 540 cubic inch motor in it. It is a real monster. Let's get ready to rock and roll. Are you ready? Let's do it. Do I need a barf bag? I don't know. Do you? Now we got to get you suited up with the parachute. Okay. We really wear parachutes? Yeah. Huh. I thought you were messing with me. Okay. I'm going to come back around. Okay. Where do I pull? That handle. Don't pull it now. Okay, I got you. Are you all psyched out? Yeah, no, I'm good. Let's go. Do it, man. <laughs> all right, we ready? Yep. Break up some tunes, baby. Yeah! All right, here we go. Right. Let's do it. We're diving into the air show box. <laughs> Remember that feeling I told you? Yeah. How is it? Nothing better than vertical. <laughs> we'll do some uh, gyroscopic tumbles. Okay. Or do you need a break for a minute? Okay. Need intermission, baby. <laughs> so I want you to grab the controls, okay? If we pull back on the stick, the nose is going to come up, right? Yeah. Okay, if we're going to go forward. Woohoo! All right, got it? Yeah. Okay, left. <laughs> Spin right. <laughs> How's that, dude? <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. I can see why you're addicted to this. <laughs> I'm at a loss for words, which is rare because I'm never at a loss for words. I didn't know which way was up, which way was down. I mean, at some point I thought I was in a video game. I really did. That was amazing. Yeah, buddy. Thank you, man. That was good. Oh, still a little wobbly. That's our very own Casey Scott from KSL 5. Kind of fun to see him, uh, just a regular civilian up in one of those planes That's getting cool. crazy. Surprisingly, he didn't throw up, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, but we also we, we wanted to welcome in Sergeant Staff, uh, Staff Sergeant Alex Zuniga, uh, who is one of the key objectives uh, of, the, uh, of an air and space show uh, recruiting. Um, Air Force recruiters walk people throughout the entire process and all the steps of joining the United States Air Force. Uh, for every potential applicant, rec recruiters discuss what the different career options are and talk about the growth opportunities and challenges that exist uh, for those who are considering joining the military service. Here to discuss that topic with us is Sergeant Alex Zuniga. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So it, it seems like there's a lot of different ways uh, that you can join the Air Force and, you know, there's certain requirements for each, but maybe could you just talk a little bit about in general, like, what are the paths uh, for Air Force service? Yeah, so there's definitely a number of different ways to, to, to go about uh, joining the Air Force. Um, what I tell everyone is you, you have to figure out kind of like where you're at and, and what you're looking to achieve. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm an active duty enlisted recruiter, so I don't handle officer sessions or ROTC or even uh, recruiting for the Guard or Reserves. Um, 
just a thanks, friendly thanks. reminder that we're live <laughs> on the yeah, tarmac. Thanks, thanks guys. Um, so we have dedicated recruiters for active duty sessions as well as guard and reserves and then officer sessions as well. Um, so if someone's looking to kind of go the college route, uh, there's there's always ROTC. So you're going to have to uh, figure out what school you want to apply for and, and uh, see if they have uh, an ROTC detachment there for, for the United States Air Force. Um, if not, you know, uh, if you're looking to kind of stay local to your area and, and serve part time, uh, you can always pursue the garden reserve route, um, which basically, you know, they, they'll work one one week in a month um, and then two weeks out of the year. So you'll, you'll go to basic military training to your technical training, uh, just like you would for active duty, except, you know, you're working a part time uh, component. And then for me dealing with active duty sessions, um, it is full time. No kidding. Air Force every single day. Um, so, I re like I said, it really just depends on, on what a person is, is kind of looking to do. Yeah, and so, uh, Sergeant Zuniga, for many considering a military career, what job uh, would they might do? Obviously, a, a major is that's a major consideration, considering that. But what kinds of jobs is the Air Force, do the Air Force um, recruit for? And, and can you can you necessarily pick your career? Is, is that a thing? Or do you kind of compartmentalize people depending on how they test out? Yeah, so, so we get that question quite often. So... So again, and, and this is going to be dependent upon the, the different components that, that an individual would, would choose to pursue. So for your guard and reserve, uh, it's going to be a little bit different. So um, a guard base, they might have a specific mission, meaning that they might not see every single AFSC, which is Air Force Specialty Code. So they might not see every job that the Air Force offers if that mission is not available at that particular location. Uh, for me, active duty Air Force, so we see every single job. Um, that that list will fluctuate, you know, as people are hired for those positions um, or, you know, whatever happens, um, you know, that, that list might change from day to day. Um, so basically what will happen is an, an individual will take the ASVAB. So it's basically like the academic test that we, that we uh, provide applicants to, to qualify them, right, to make sure that they're, they're eligible for the Air Force. And then based on that score, they're going to get another score within four different aptitude areas. So we test generally for mechanics, administration, general, and electronics. So um, your score will be computed in some way, and that'll kind of tell us, you know, you have the best ability to learn in, in this particular field. It doesn't mean that someone has to go into that field if, if they don't want to, um, but we'll kind of use that to, to kind of help them with their career counseling, right? So again, if someone scores uh, pretty high in like the mechanical aptitude area, um, it would obviously, I would hope that they would be interested in uh, mechanics or mechanically inclined, and I would kind of steer them that route. So after they take that test and they go to MEPS to take a physical, that'll tell us what they're eligible for. They'll provide us a list of jobs that they're interested in and that they are guaranteed to get one of those jobs. Ah, so you kind of, they'll take the test, you'll gently guide them one direction and say, hey, this is based up, based upon what you know and how uh, your brain works or how you test it, this is, this is something that you might uh, excel in. Yes, sir. And, 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 then, and then from there, they can actually submit a list, if I understood correctly, and then they're guaranteed one of that list, and then Correct. the others, you kind of go from there and say, hey, you know, we, you kind of need to test a little differently maybe to, to, to get into that desired spot or yeah so so the way it works is what what I will tell everyone is is you have to be marketable to the Air Force right so the Air Force offers a world of opportunity um, we have to get into the Air Force to be able to take advantage of those opportunities and again so I cannot guarantee a specific job uh, that's why we have to make sure that you know uh, people are going to want to be in the Air Force ab above all else um, but yeah that, 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 that's the core drive is that yep yes yeah. sir Gotcha. Yeah, and so I and I imagine this is a pretty common question. All the time we get it. But another common question that I think you probably get is like, you know, what are my chances of getting in and how long would it take for me to go to basic military training? <laughs> yes, sir. That's that's a million dollar question. Everyone wants to know, hey, how how quickly can I go? And then my response to that is typically gonna be like, Well, um, how ready are you, right? Because if someone says, hey, I, I want to go to basic training tomorrow, uh, but if, you know, their list of jobs isn't uh, very in demand, if they're not jobs that the Air Force is, like, really hiring for really hard, um, then they might be sitting around waiting a little bit longer. Um, I've had people who they, they finish MEPS, they take the process, they qualify, and uh, they, they'll be out of the door in two weeks because they are ready to go, they have their bags packed, and they're, they're willing to be in the Air Force. Um, so it really just depends. That, that's a tough one to kind of answer. A, it's like situational, yes, right? Sir. Like, yep. So if you want to leave fast, you, 
have your bags packed. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. Okay. And, and, and right. take it when you're ready. Yeah. yeah, and be flexible. You know, be be ready to take what the Air Force is uh, offering at that time. So. And, so, and so what about the case that somebody specialized in something? Like, I went to school, and, and actually, now that I think about it, she was probably actually enlisted within the program. She's local. Uh, Chandler Alston, she's a local meteorologist for Hill Air Force Base. So what if somebody comes to you and says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm specialized in X, Y, or Z. Do you consider them? Do you, do you, do you uh, what? Is that a possibility? Can someone say, hey, I think this could be really useful for the Air Force. Is there a spot for me? Or, or is it more, hey, no, take the test. We want to do it, you know, or how, how does that work? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so what we'll do for a situation like that is we have what we consider like a competency booking. Now, I, I never like to make guarantees, right, because I'm sure we've all heard uh, people's stories of, hey, my recruiter lied to me or this or that. So, <laughs> so we really we really try we try and stay away from that, right? Um, but what we'll do is we'll take someone's experience into account. So if someone does have unique experience, uh, basically what I'll do is I'll take that, whether it's formal education or certifications, I'll take that experience uh, and I'll submit that up to, to our unit leadership and we'll try and find a spot for them in an area that they already have some sort of background in. Cool. cool. So true story, my recruiter in a small high school uh, recruited me and a couple of my friends. We joined the Air Force. Fast forward 10 years later, he was a staff sergeant at the time. Now he's a master sergeant, and I'm a staff sergeant, and we're in the same unit. We actually Very work cool. together. That so I funny. actually worked with my recruiter for, for a full year at Osan, Korea. How crazy is that? that? They do say it's a small Air Force, right? Yeah. So um, we, we hear stories like that all the time. Yeah. So we, we talked about, like, the process and the testing and what might be a good fit for your size. And what, what are some of the other benefits uh, that are available to those who might uh, seek an Air Force career, like education, pay? I mean travel i mean there's got to be a ton right yes sir so i don't know if we have enough time on the program <laughs> to, to cover everything that the air force offers um but what i'll tell anyone that comes into my office is you have to know your why right everyone has a why for for why they decide to enlist um for me mine was education and travel so so far i've had you know 100 percent of my uh, education paid for i'm currently uh pursuing my bachelor's degree um my wife as well. My wife is active duty. She got her bachelor's degree. She's working on her master's degree. Um, so it really depends. You know, if you're going into the Air Force and you know that that's what you're hoping to get out of it, um, that opportunity is there. Uh, travel, right? That, we hear that one all the time as well. Hey, I want to join the Air Force. I want to travel. I have sent people to basic training and whenever they graduate, um, I've, they've been to Korea. They've been to Germany. They've been all over Europe. Uh, you know, all over Asia. Um, I have had a few who have come right back here to Hill Air Force Base. Luckily, this is a beautiful area, and, and it's pretty desirable. Um, so I don't really have control over it, but if you want to travel, the Air Force definitely has that opportunity. Yeah, I, 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 now I remember uh, in high school and college, uh, they'd have the Air Force, they'd have the U.S. Army and the Navy, you know, throughout the year, depending on the year, uh, come through and give presentations. And, and I remember one of the biggest things that, that attracted people were the benefits. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, some of those great benefits that you guys offer to people that are going to onboard? Yeah, absolutely. So probably the most common one that we'll see is going to be education, right? Um, if anyone who's been paying attention, education is and, expensive. And that is paid for? Yes, okay. absolutely. So there are a number of education entitlements. So uh, there's the GI Bill, which will pay up to 36 months of college tuition, which is like a full four years of college tuition. Wow. Most people will reserve that one for when they separate from the Air Force. Or um, if you have a spouse and children, uh, you can pass that on to them as well, which is which is that's, huge, right? That's huge. That's that's huge. Yes, sir. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to set my children up. So that is my plan. You know, pass that on to them because I'll be able to get my bachelor's degree while I'm currently serving active duty. And that's another question we get all the time is, hey, if I serve active duty full time, am I even going to have time to go to school? The answer is yes. Yes, uh, you will have time. So although you will see that we are on duty 24-7, that doesn't mean that we are working 24 hours a day. Um, so... The Air Force will give you time to go to school. So a lot of jobs in the Air Force, they're pretty corporate. You know, you work 7 to 4. Um, we'll have a swing shift and a mid shift, so it really depends. But you're going to have your time off while while you're in the Air Force. So what you do at that time is up to you. Some great shots there on your screen of Brad Worston in the extra 330 LX. Like Matt said, a local guy from the Logan, Utah area. And so, Sergeant Zaniga, we've talked about the benefits and jobs, but what kind of physical shape or other standards uh, 
are really important if you're considering joining the Air Force. So physical fitness and mental fitness are going to be huge. Um, so although the Air Force, we do not have a, uh, we do not necessarily have a physical requirement aside from a height and weight requirement. Uh, we don't make them do a PT test, so there's no run, push-up, sit-ups, or anything like that, unless someone is interested in special warfare. Um, so that is going to be a completely separate side of the recruiting, right? Um, it takes a different mentality to want to do that, to want to jump out of airplanes and, and do all that cool stuff. Um, so if that's the path that someone's interested in, they'll definitely have to, to take that physical test. But for us, so long as you meet the height and weight requirement, um, as well as a number of other academic and uh, medical sessions requirements, um, you're good, right? I, I did want to talk about Air Force Special Warfare recruiting specifically just because there's a lot of people out there who are interested in that, but they actually have people that will work with you developers uh, before you actually go into the Air Force to basic military training, right? Yes, sir. Yep. So the reason why that program came about is because um, we really, the Air Force, it costs a lot of money to send people to that to that kind of training, right? And so um, before when you're just sending anyone that can meet the requirement, well, just because you can meet the requirement doesn't necessarily mean that you have the greatest chance of succeeding. So the development program is awesome. Uh, I believe here we have a retired combat controller or, or uh, tactical air control party airman um, who's been through it, so knows what to look for. Um, so yeah, they'll, they'll work with you. If you can meet the requirements, they will work with you until they feel that someone is ready and has a greater chance of succeeding through that training pipeline for those career fields. Yeah, and so for those who are tuning in, you know, it's, uh, you, you take, it sounds like you take a, I can't remember the name of it, but a general test, uh, and, and then from there, uh, you guys will assess, you know, what's the best for them, but it also sounds like you, you, uh, you're, you're, you're working with people. You're not going to force them into something that they don't want to be in. And Correct. I think, right. And I think sometimes that's a, that's a, um, a real concern of some people, you know, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to devote my life to the Air Force of the Air, you know. Um, I think some people get worried about that, but it sounds like, you know, that it's 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 not as uh, rigid as, as as one might think. You know, but you're willing to work with people like, hey, you're specialized in this. Let's, let's see what we can do uh, and get you into that sector that you might be more passionate in, or that you might excel in a little bit more. And honestly, with that the the opening test, the the, the broad brushing test that you guys give them, maybe they might discover something they didn't know that they were good at. Absolutely. So there's a wild, a uh, huge benefit. So let's play Mythbusters. What are <laughs> maybe the top two or three myths that you hear most, and can you debunk those myths? Yeah, so I have, and even just today, I've heard it probably five to ten times. Uh, people coming up to me, and they say, hey, I heard that the Air Force is the hardest branch to qualify for because you need the highest ASVAB score. That is not true. That is a myth. So um, our standard right now is a 31, same as the other services. Um so sometimes people, that's a barrier to entry for whatever reason. They like don't think that they can meet the requirements, and it's like, hey, no, it's it's not any more different than than joining any other branch. Um, that that is a huge one. Uh, I know there are some more. I can't think of them off the top of my head, uh, but we definitely hear a lot of crazy stuff. And I did just for a moment want to talk about diversity and inclusion. The Air Force welcomes everybody. Absolutely, man, woman doesn't matter. Join, come join us, right? Yes, sir. Take the test. You know, come talk to a recruiter. Uh, so if someone is really interested in joining the Air Force, um, what are some ways maybe that they could reach out if they don't live near a recruiter? So airforce.com is going to be the greatest source of information. Um, so on the airforce.com website, there's going to be a, if you scroll down to the bottom of the website, there's going to be a link that says find my recruiter. Um, in that link, it's going to ask you briefly what your education background is. It's going to ask you if you're interested in special warfare. And then it's going to ask you to put the zip code of where you live. Uh, when you put your zip code in, it's going to pull up the information for the nearest recruiter to you. Um, now, that is that is going to be for the active duty side of the house. If you're interested in guard or reserve, you know, you're going to have to go to those respective components websites. So uh, guard and reserve, you know, you're going to go to the, like, uh, Utah State Air National Guard. Um, so that'll be a little bit different. But, yeah, that'll put you in contact with the nearest recruiter to you it'll have their phone number as well as their email and then you can reach out to them that way and dan maybe another myth buster i th i think a lot of people um, think about this and i think it's a great question to ask um because i think a lot of people get spooked and this might be another myth is you know oh well i don't know if i want to get in the air force what if i get called to duty and i got to go to war and put my life on the line you know what um how do you how uh, is that true you know I, I think that's a huge mental barrier to entry mm -hmm. is that some people in all honest truth are, are concerned about but I, I 
my experience has been with my friends that are in the U.S. Uh, Air Force, that's not always the case. Just because you enlist and join doesn't mean you're going to, you know, have to go out there and, and, and put your life on the line in Iraq or, or wherever it may be, Russia. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Because I think that's a huge, at least for me growing up, I know I had a lot of friends, uh, you know, it was a question. We're concerned. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's a valid concern. Um, what I will tell people is, you know, you, you have to understand what you're doing, right? Because uh, although the Air Force, we are much different than the capabilities that the Army, Marine Corps, and Navy bring to the fight, um, it is what we are part of, right? At the end of the day, we are part of the Department of Defense, and our mission is to fly, fight, and win and protect the United and that's States. something to be proud of, too. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Um, but for those individuals that have concerns about, you know, being on the front lines, or it, that is just not what we necessarily do in the Air Force. So these jets around us, that is our mission. Um, so where our primary focus is going to be is is keeping those jets in the air, right? That takes an incredible crew of maintainers, of crew chiefs, of uh, people that are in avionics, supply, weapons, ammo. There are so many career fields. Everything that you do in the Air Force in some way is going to support this mission behind us. Of, uh, maybe not the air show, right. but yeah, well, even then in the air show, right, we have a crew of maintainers that are there to make sure that these aircraft are functioning correctly. Um, and that's extremely important when, uh, you know, we're conducting operations somewhere and, you know, we have a no-fail mission, you know. So um, I definitely get those concerns, but uh, it's just not necessarily what we do. Love it. Love well, it. we really appreciate you stopping by. Again. The Aim High phone app is also a way Absolutely. to potentially connect with the recruiter. So Sergeant Alex Zaniga, you guys will be out here all weekend, Yes, right? sir. Yes, we will. You got a booth or something? Yes, we do. So we've got our national asset. We've got an F-35 flight simulator. We've got a ton of stuff back here. Very if cool. anyone's interested, uh, please stop by. You need to take your buddy to the... <laughs> yeah, we need to get in the simulator. There you go. Dude, there's a line. I'd recommend getting in line <laughs> soon. Well, hopefully I can show on the media. No, I'm <laughs> Okay. Pass. <laughs> All right, so we're going to learn a little bit more as Brad Wurst continues to fly about the Gold Bar Officer Recruiters. Let's take a look. The Gold Bar program is pretty unique because it offers newly commissioned second lieutenants a one-year special duty purely focused on recruiting for Air Force ROTC. Now the Gold Bars are able to get outside of the university and reach out into the local community that focused on proctoring tests, um, volunteering, helping on the base, and heading up base events as well. This has allowed us to now utilize Air Force Recruiting Services to where we can better reach out to the community um, through local community involvement events, through reaching high schools and universities, and by collaborating to conduct total force recruiting efforts. If you aspire to be something, look out for a mentor, someone who can guide you along the way, and be that visible person for someone in the future. bit more about the Gold Bar Officer Recruiter Program. Again, uh, Sergeant Zaniga and his entire team of recruiters will be out here all weekend long, so go check out the booth. I I know uh, you're going to be changing out soon, but it sounds like you may want to go fly the F-35 simulator. Oh, I got to get in there. I, I just think it's so cool that these guys not only have to train mentally, uh, they have to be good on paper, they have to be good physically to fly these these jets and these planes, and they're out there defending our country, and it'd be cool to, to simulate that and be like, you know, oh, this is what Tom Cruise is doing. It, not really, but actually, he is that actor. He actually learned how to fly and taught and, and made the, the other uh, actors learn how to fly, some of them. I, I think that's pretty cool, but... Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go check that out. And, and I think where we're getting at, Dan, is that there's more than just the air show going on. Absolutely. We've got the STEM program you can come check out. I mean, bring your kids. It's kid-friendly. Some you got static aircraft that you can – I think some of them you can get inside of, Am I, if I'm not yep. mistaken. Yep. Uh, and, 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 you know, we – it's cool. Another aspect is – there's a lot of people out here that have served our country, a lot of veterans that come out to these shows, and you can talk to them. And the, the, the sense of American pride, Utah pride, is really it's buzzing in the air. It's kind of fun to be around, you know, this, uh, this atmosphere of, of pride for our country and, and, and people who have served it. And, and not to mention the inner meteorologist in me, it's such great weather out here. Uh, so, I mean, we, we could easily 
be triple digits you, this time of year. You might want to talk to the Gold Bar officer recruiter because they have weather officers. So just saying. Just, oh, I'm man. just throwing that out there. Dan man. is so good at recruiting. We might need to get <laughs> You are a staff sergeant after all. There you go. I used to be way back in the day. All right. So we have still a lot to go on. The P-51 is going to fly. The A-10 Warthog. Uh, the Thunderbolt 2, that is going to be flying. Uh, so we are going to take a break for a little while and go out to the Air Boss, listen to the narration. Debbie Worthen from your KSL yep. 5 is going to be coming out. Uh, you guys are going to be doing the super high five and tag out. And I'm actually, I, I, I won't lie, maybe a little bit jealous as you see the P-51 there on the ramp. You're going to get to go around and check out all these oh. exhibits. I know you're going to be busy all day long. You better stop by before you head I, home. I've got to. I've, I've got to go check out some of those planes. I'm just so fascinated, and especially since one of my friends is actually training to be a pilot for Delta Airlines. He talks to me about the physics of these planes and how they fly, a two-prop plane, a sport cruiser, a jets, a G-force. It's really fascinating, uh, and, and it's just cool to have these static aircraft. Not only can you watch them in the air do their thing, but you can walk up to these, touch them, look at them. Well, maybe we don't want them, yeah. people touching them too much, but uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is you can go out to these some of these uh, aircraft, and when we say static, they're just they're not in the air, they're not moving. To put, uh, and you can you can walk up to them and do your thing and check them out. And uh, gosh, we can't forget about that F F thirty five simulator. I just think that'd be really cool. I have to I have to go check that. Oh, and we got vendors. We got yep. vendors out yep. here. So yeah, all you can eat, drink, whatever. Watch the air show. Got the F thirty five demo teams coming up this afternoon. The U S Air Force Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds. There you go. So it's going to be a lot of fun. He's Matt Johnson. I'm Dan Hawkins. We're going to send it out to the Air Boss for more of the Warriors of the Wasatch Air and Space Show. European theaters. This one of over fifteen thousand that were built. Now on the registry around the world, there are only about a hundred and twenty-five or so. That's an approximate number still on the registry and about any given day there are about probably 70 that are in airworthy condition and that can fly part of the beauty of this airplane is the sound the music of the rolls-royce merlin engine made it up to the p-51 well into the war allowing it to do things i'll explain to you later and built by the Packard Motor Car Company under license in Detroit, Michigan for World War II and this airplane. Now, if you look out in the dynamite field, you might see three mock tanks out there as a, a little gimmick. See the profile of the tanks? They're painted dark so that you can pick them out. We're going to have some fun with pyro. We're going to get the P-51 into the real environment. And see, it was not only a dogfight aircraft, but also a ground attack aircraft as well. Mark Peterson, the steward of the aircraft, and currently the pilot. Hell or Bust is the name of this aircraft. Flown in World War II by a pilot by the name of Heller, H-E-L-L-E-R. The aircraft was initially mated to an American-built Allison engine that didn't have the capability to put the airplane into the higher dogfight altitudes. It was not the airplane's fault. It had all of the qualifications. It had the laminar flow wing. It had the sleek design. It had streamline. It had speed. But it couldn't get up to the dogfight arena. Early in the war, with that American-built engine, it was relegated to low-level dogfights and ground-based attacks. When they put the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine in with a two-speed supercharger, it gave the airplane another 10,000 feet of dogfight altitude and another 100 knots of speed. That made all the difference in the world. With approximately 500 gallons of fuel inside and outside of the airplane, it was able to escort our four-engine daylight bombers deep into enemy territory and back. Watch and listen to this. Ground attack on an enemy field. And there is the sound, the music of the Merlin engine.
By the way, as we're talking about the recent release about a month ago this weekend of Top Gun Maverick movie starring Tom Cruise, who owns an airplane like this and flies it extensively. Watch as Mark Peterson comes whistling in for the vertical roll. Out of the giant loop, he'll go and transition into the half cumin eight turnaround maneuver or five eighths of a loop. On the bottom of the airplane, you may see a big scoop between the wings and on the belly of the aircraft. This was a liquid cooled engine, much like many of the cars and trucks that you operate. If the enemy shot out your lubricant, your engine would heat up and it would seize and you would have the glide ratio of a cement block. Now, while that creates a quite a bit of drag, the engineers at North American Aviation sought to negate that drag. They actually made the radiator scoop a jet engine. It's got a big opening in front, a small variable opening in back, and they were actually able to get 300 pounds of thrust from the back of the radiator by that design, thereby negating that big bulge that you see there. Barrel roll maneuver meant to shake the enemy off your tail. Next pass coming in by Mark Peterson and the P-51 Top Gun Mustang will be the victory roll after air-to-air -air combat. Pilot coming back to home base in the European theater. If he had shot down one of the enemy aircraft, he would do a victory roll over the skies of the friendly field. There it is. 4 point roll. showing you the cockpit environment this time. Coordinated change of direction, speed, and altitude. Oh, victory roll coming up for the hot pass. We'll have Pyro on the ground from Firewalkers Pyro International and a strafe from Mark Peterson as he attempts to get the remainder of those tanks. Victory roll was promised. The sun reflecting off the highly polished paint scheme. Well, it is said in air-to-air -air combat, if you can't turn tight, you can't fight. Now with this vintage 1940s airplane coming back in, Mark Peterson is going to set up for a minimum radius turn, and he'll be pulling an awesome six times the force of gravity as he does the tight combat turn.
right from your left coming in. This should be another hot pass. As we maneuver aircraft in the air and aircraft on the ground, and again, time, I want to keep you folks very comfortable. I worry about you here, our great spectators. Remember suntan, sun blockers, sun lotion, and hydrate. Keep hydrated throughout the course of the day. If you want to take a little break right now between landing and taking off aircraft, feel free to do it. Head for the facilities. Action will continue. Remember, we're going to be entertaining you till about 4.30 this afternoon. We'll give the Thunderbirds the airspace at 3.30. That's right over the top of the control tower, P-51 Mustang. Remember, tell him it's a Packard engine. It was built in America. And when the general said that, we made a change. So listen to this. external tanks and 500 gallons or so of fuel, taking our four-engine B-24s and B-17s deep into enemy territory in World War II, keeping the enemy fighter pilots at bay, tremendously reducing the attrition rate of the shoot-downs of our four-engine bombers, which each carried about 10 young men from across America, from coast to coast, here in Utah, some on their first flight, failure to return. And then here comes the P-51, other escort aircraft, but nobody did it as good as the P-51. The same type of aircraft flown by the Tuskegee Airmen, the Red Tail Squadron of African-American pilots who fought on two fronts. They fought fascism and racism, and they excelled. They were exemplary. And we honor them each and every day, the Red Tail Squadron that were requested by the bomber pilots to be their personal escort because they protected the bomber pilots. They didn't run off to seek glory in a dogfight and leave the bombers vulnerable. So that's the type of airframe, among others, like the P-47, the P-38, that did the job. It could fly from ground level, it could fight from ground level up to 39,000 feet. Over 2,000 rounds of 50 caliber ammo for six machine guns, each shooting 850 rounds per minute, and again, fighting, fighting from sea level up to 39,000 feet.
takeoff blow roll going to your right. It's a new de Havilland aircraft, one of two of the U.S. Army Golden Knights. One today for the black demonstration team performing here at Hill. The other one with the gold demonstration team at an air show somewhere else. Doors open. Now, if you were here before, you know they're going to go up to 2,000 feet above the field. But stay slow. They'll drop weighted streamers. Streamers are weighted at the bottom, so they present a vertical target. They are multicolored. It reduces the tendency of the banners to float in the air, or actually gain altitude through thermals, and presents a vertical picture rather than a horizontal picture. The team members will be at that back door. The airplane will be in a left bank turn. They will watch to see what the banners are doing from 2,000 feet onto the ground. They know the surface winds. They know the winds at 3,000, 6,000, 9,000, 12,000 feet. And with that in mind, they'll determine where they are going to exit the airplane in relation to the target, as very seldom they drop directly over the target area. As our early birds will tell you, depending on which family can enjoy that all day long. Take home a memento of the air show. And I'll remind you, too, of the Top Gun Maverick movie, seeing its fourth weekend. <laughs>